tonight, we have Dr. Aslam here, who's going to talk about chronic lung disease in premature infants, which is um, an incredibly compelling talk, having seen him um, uh, on this several times now. I want to take a few minutes, though, and set up his lecture and kind of the basic science side of the lecture. While he's a clinician scientist, there are some things about the particular cell population that he works with that I think it's really important for everyone in the audience to understand. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes and just kind of set up where he's going in terms of his lecture with some basic background. Now, the particular kinds of cells that he's used in his work are called mesenchymal stem cells or mesenchymal stem cells. Um, and these are most commonly derived from two possible sources. One is bone marrow and the other is umbilical cord. But you can also get them from adipose tissue, in other words, fat, um, amnion or amnion epithelial membrane, and even placenta are places that these cells are isolated from. Why is that important? Well, I'm going to try and walk you through that in a few slides. These cells um, were first defined, the cell population. Oh, great. Rebecca, um, as mesenchymal uh, stem cells by a gentleman named Arnold Kaplan in about 1991. So this is the very first paper that was published that identifies um, the population of cells that are, have self-renewing capacity and are derived from these tissues. And he called them mesenchymal stem cells. He defined in that paper that they can form, thank you, ma'am. Um, that they can form the following tissues, bone, cartilage, tendon, ligament, marrow, stroma, adipocytes, fat, um, dermis, or contribute to skin, muscle, and connective tissue. And that was pretty exciting at the time. The idea that one stem cell population had been isolated, that had the capacity to be able to contribute to all of these different lineages. In fact, um, between that time, 1991 and 2019, we know an awful lot more about these cells, not surprisingly, than we did at the time. So this is a recent diagram that came out uh, sort of encapsulating the field of mesenchymal stem cell research during this period published in Nature Protocols. We know a lot more about these cells and the complexity of how they interact than we did then. For example, we know that they um, are almost always affiliated with the vasculature. So the niche for these cells, where they live, is a perivascular niche, and it's maybe the contribution of a perivascular stem cell that's really the origin of a mesenchymal cell. But in that complexity, we found out a couple of other things. The field launched forward dramatically, not just in terms of basic science research, but in terms of something that Dr. Cummings spoke to um, this audience about back in June, and that is the direct-to-consumer marketing of stem cells. And this is why I felt like it was important to set up Muhammad's work a little bit and spend a few minutes there. So this picture is actually from a paper that was published in um, Nature just about a year ago. The title of it was Clear Up This stem cellness mess. And it's all because of the issue of mesenchymal stem cells and how complicated a population this is. So the call here was from a number of ethicists in the field, including Lee Turner, who um, we have a close relationship with at UCI. And the contention is that confusion about mesenchymal stem cells is really making it much easier for clinics and direct-to-consumer marketing clinics to be able to sell unproven treatments and sell them in the absence of FDA regulation. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to pick up just a couple of Brian's slides tonight, but I would really encourage you to look at that lecture. It's called Hope Versus Height. I'm going to show you the title of it in a second, because this is really important distinction to understand. So the kind of work that happens in an academic research center versus what happens in direct-to-market clinics. And it is a huge part of the questions that we get on a day-to-day -day and a week-to-week -week basis in the center. So I felt like it was worth spending some time here. So from this uh, um, this is from the same paper, from the same Nature paper that came out about a year ago. And you can see, I'm just going to shout out for a second. Um, this is the start, going back to 1991, when, in fact, these first studies were published in the stem cells. A lot of research that happened between up here in two particular studies that came out in 2014 and in 2016. And what those brought to light from the FDA side was that a mesenchymal stem cell is not a mesenchymal stem cell is not a mesenchymal stem cell. They are not the same. And by the same token, this 2016 paper um, that's highlighted here, and I'm going to show you some figures from that in a second, was the first one to say these cell populations, everybody's calling them mesenchymal stem cells, and they're not. And you guys think you know what you're working with. 
and you don't. And if you're going to take these to direct to market clinics, we had better figure that out and be able to do a better job than we are right now. So what do I really mean by that? Well, mesenchymal stem cells from different adult tissues really are functionally different and they don't all have the same capacity. So when we're doing academic research, that's one thing because we characterize those cells pretty carefully. In a direct to market consumer setting, the concern is that that doesn't necessarily happen. So if you look up here at this graph, this is called uh, principal component analysis. It's a way that we look at data that's complicated data in science. This happens to be from the transcriptome all of the RNA species that are being made by cell populations that are isolated from these different tissues. So, thank you. Perfect, and there we go again. Um, that's Rebecca, yay, Rebecca. <laughs> So these are mesenchymal stem cells, ostensibly the same population that were isolated from either bone marrow or muscle or periosteum or the umbilical cord blood. And if you map them out in three-dimensional space in terms of what they're actually making, they don't overlap at all. They're functionally completely different. And this was critical to understand at the time. So this is the first paper to come out and do that. And not only did it say that they map out differently in terms of the stuff they're making, what their transcriptome looks like. In fact, they map out completely differently in terms of what their capacity is. So these cells, as I showed you from the original Kaplan paper, should be able to make bone and they should be able to make muscle if they're truly a stem cell. But in fact, if you put them to the test in a dish, isolated from adult, mesenchymal cells from bone marrow can't make muscle, periosteum can't, cord blood can't, only mesenchymal cells isolated from muscle actually make muscle, and that's what's shown in the red labeling here. So they have different potential and different functions when you're isolating them from the adult system. And that makes sense because this is a part of normal development. There's cell-to-cell -cell communication and an environment, a niche that these cells sit in all the time, and that's really critical to how they function. If we just pull them willy-nilly out of everywhere and expect them to do everything, we're asking an awful lot. It, they can't function like that because they're meant to be programmed by what's around them. So why is that important? Now we come back to this hope versus hype lecture because here, this is the most common cell population, in fact, that's used in direct-to-marketing clinics. So again, this is a paper by Lee Turner and Paul Knopfler, who's up at UC Davis, who have looked into the ethics of direct-to-market clinics very closely. This happens to be a great paper um, that came out uh, about four years ago now. And Brian highlighted this in his lecture. One, just the proliferation of the number of these direct-to-consumer marketing clinics that are out there. Everything that you see in red here, and I know that this is out of date. In fact, Lee would say that this number of clinics has almost doubled in the last four years across the country. A huge concentration in Southern California, a large concentration in Florida, Colorado, and Texas are the highest states um, proportionally across. Um, why does that matter? I'm gonna come back and talk about mesenchymal stem cells in the context of those clinics in just a moment, but it matters, these direct-to-marketing clinics, because stuff can go wrong with cell therapies, and this is very important to educate the community about and people to consider. Cells can remain in a pluripotent or a proliferative state, and if that happens, you can get a tumor in a location that was unintended because you're not controlling that stem cell population very well. Cells may mature and differentiate properly, but if they migrate to the wrong place and they make muscle, for example, in brain or you know, toenail in your appendix, that's a problem, right? They're following cues that may be present, but you still can get to cells that are non-functional or inappropriate and cause more problems than they help. The products that are made can contain um, contaminants resulting in adverse reactions or infections. And in fact, in California, two production facilities were shut down just about a year ago for this very reason. And there have been cases across the US where patients that have gone to these clinics have lost vision or even died as a result of infections that have come from poorly managed stem cell populations that have been marketed in these direct-to-consumer clinics. Um, Critically, for people like I work on spinal cord injury, if you go to a direct-to-market clinic, 
There are many things moving forward, especially for neurological diseases, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, that have real promise in the clinic that are being done in academic clinical trials, but a direct-to-market therapy may result in being excluded from the potential to be involved in any of those future clinical trials, which is not what people generally want, but unfortunately, clinics don't necessarily tell the folks that are coming in the door that. Um, it could be the case that there's no effect, right? But these are sometimes being marketed at twenty or $30,000 per shot. So if you put all of your money into going down this unproven direct-to-market path and get nothing for it, that's a pretty significant financial burden for most families, right? That's not something that can be spent lightly. And last of all, something that concerns us a lot here is the potential for loss of the public trust in terms of science, right? We wanna be able to talk to you and communicate the great science that's being done here. Dr. Oslin being a terrific example of that, but it's very hard to say this is the way you should do it and a direct to market clinic down the block say, oh no, you don't need to do all of that. I have the magic shot here. It's just gonna cost you X, right? So we worry a lot about the loss of trust um, in terms of the important work that we think we do here and getting the easy answer from outside somewhere else. So hopefully you'll all think about that. I thought I would just put this in since I'm a little bit on my soapbox tonight. Um, a checklist, this is in uh, Dr. Cummings' slides from his Hope to Hype lecture, but things that really need to be thought about if you have you know, your grandmother, your grandfather, aunt, or uncle, mom, dad, whatever, that are looking at these, a stem cell product is not a universal treatment. If you look at a website for a clinic that's doing direct to consumer marketing and it says it treats anything, I can almost guarantee you it's nothing. It's not based on real research. You need to understand the difference between FDA approved products and authorized clinical trials um, and what's going on in these direct to market centers. And so if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is going all the way back to Roman times. Um, it's important to know how to identify valid clinical trials. If you are interested in this, you can certainly contact us. But again, that Hope to Hype lecture has a lot of tools for people to be able to use to make this judgment and discrimination. Um, among them are checking uh, on something called PubMed and Googling for information. There are ways to do that and also um, uh, uh, ways to triage you know, what's being claimed by direct-to-consumer marketing versus academic clinical trials. Again, the lecture carries a lot of the detail for this. If you are at all in doubt, you really should be talking about this with your um, normal physician or in the case if you have a neurological disease, your neurologist, your whatever expert is involved, discuss with them and decide whether whatever it is you found is actually the right thing for you or whether it, it has more risks than potential rewards, whatever those may be. And um, finally, if you're asked to pay for something that's a therapy, period, you are not in a clinical trial. So many of these director consumer marketing clinics will say that they're running a clinical trial. They put their uh, work up up on a website called clinicaltrials.gov to give them cover, but you can put anything on clinicaltrials.gov. That doesn't make it a clinical trial. And if they're asking for 10 or $20,000 for an injection, I guarantee you it is not a clinical trial because we're not allowed to charge for clinical trials. And I speak as the director of the Stem Cell Center where we're running clinical trials out of this building. It can't work that way. Okay, so these direct-to-consumer marketing uh, clinics uh, almost always are using cells that are mesenchymal in origin. So again, this same cell population that we've just been talking about, going back to 1991 and Arnold Kaplan. In fact, if we look at the breakdown here, adipose and bone marrow, which are these here, are the, the two that I highlighted, right, as being the main sources of mesenchymal cell types that are, that are out there. Most of these, um, blood, placental, and so on, all these small fractions are generally cells uh, that are also mesenchymal maybe stem cells, maybe not in terms of the product, but mesenchymal in origin that are coming from these direct-to-market um, clinics. And that is important because the conditions that these cells are being marketed for mostly don't have anything to do with the mesenchymal lineage, right? So you're asking a cell that grew up to do one thing, to jump ship and do something else, and the odds of that working out terribly well are not super high. So everything that is highlighted here in a star in terms of the distribution of conditions that are being marketed with these cell therapeutics are not, they're a mismatch between mesenchymal cells and the actual organ or tissue or place where something is going wrong. Why is that important? Well, we know, in fact, as I highlighted before, a lot more about these cells than we did certainly 30 or 40 years ago. 
In fact, we know some interesting things where maybe they can help the autoimmune disease, where they can modulate um, immune function in a way that would be beneficial. There may be some broad reaching categories that mesenchymal stem cells can touch on that we know from our basic research that could be useful. But we also know that they behave really differently from one another, depending upon where they come from. And as I highlighted, they can't do everything, right? Only muscle-derived mesenchymal cells are able to make muscle. So you can try and rebuild muscle all day long with bone marrow-derived ones, and they're not going to work. They just can't jump ship and do that. And so understanding these boundaries in the context of all of the different conditions that are being marketed is something that's really important to make a distinction of and think about. And these clinics don't do it. The parallel would be if you're thinking about a bench to, to bedside, um, this continuum that we've talked about, asking mesenchymal stem cells, for example, to help neurological disease like autism or Parkinson's disease is like asking a fish to ride a bicycle. It's just not what those cells do. In fact, it was so hyped at one point, I can tell you from my lab, we use a kind of mesenchymal cell as a control for spinal cord injury because it doesn't like to be in the central nervous system. Those cells don't survive and they don't engraft there. So you really are are asking those cells to do something that is just outside of their capacity for control. So careful about those clinics. But what about lung? I told you that Dr. Oslin, with all of these cautions that I've given you now, um, is working on pediatric lung disease and using mesenchymal cells or their products as one avenue to a treatment. So how does that line up? How does that work? If we go back to this overall kind of massive tree of development, right? And just the concept that stem cells and development make up all of the organs and tissues that are present in our bodies. How do we align that with using a mesenchymal cell for something like what Dr. Oslin is going for. Oh, I'll go back one. Well, actually, the lung is a really interesting tissue, and that's, that's true for many of the organs and tissues in your body embryologically or from a developmental point of view. It's composed of different lineages. In fact, it has all three of these lineages that are present in it, and it's the communication in particular between mesoderm, so mesenchymal stem cells, and endoderm, that result in mature, normal lung development. And the orchestrator for that is actually the mesenchymal stem cell, which has a huge impact in terms of maturing respiratory specification, more how, how uh, branched the alveoli get, epithelial differentiation, lineage distinction, so that communication between the mesenchymal cells or their products in that case, in the context of lung and lung development, in a developing organism like a neonate, an immature infant, is actually a place where the mesenchymal stem cells make a whole lot of sense. And that's what we're supposed to do at an academic institution, is to investigate those things. Does that make sense? So with that background, all the caveats that I've given you, and I hope setting up the context for why the kind of clinical-oriented but basic science translational pipeline research that Dr. Aslam is going to tell you about is so important and why that basic science to translational pipeline in an academic setting is so important. I hope I've convinced you of that. And with that, I want to introduce Dr. Aslam. After all this introduction, I'm just going to briefly go over. So I'm a physician scientist. So most of my work is in the clinic and I'm a neonatologist, perinatologist. So I work with premature babies and work in a neonatal ICU. As any of you have experience where you have like a family member or relative who was admitted to a neonatal intensive care unit, born premature or has some issues and spent some time in the ICU. So not much. Yeah. So, <laughs> so basically, like, what's the biggest challenge we have right now that we are working with and trying to work with these stem cells is that, as Eileen mentioned, we don't want these wrong stem cells in wrong hands. We also don't want right stem cells in wrong hands because that causes a lot of mistrust in us. And as a physician and clinician, what we see is the biggest challenge for a lot of families is getting pregnant. There is like in vitro fertilization, they go through a lot of routes, and sometimes they come to us, they are pregnant, and this is their only hope. Mom is 40, 45 years old, they have been trying for last 15, 20 years, and unfortunately, they have to deliver this baby premature. So 
normal pregnancy is about nine months or 40 weeks, we say. It. Anything less than 37 weeks is a premature delivery or premature pregnancy. And the biggest challenge for a premature baby is that their lungs are not developed. They cannot breathe outside of the mom's womb. Once they are born, we make these lungs to work. We make these lungs to do gas exchange. With our efforts to do gas exchange, these lungs get damaged. That's neonatal chronic lung disease. That's how the lung disease starts in these babies. At present, we don't have anything which can correct it. Because if a baby is born, there were times when I started my training almost 10 years ago, a baby who is born at 25 weeks or less, we will consider it as an abortion. Yeah. So now with advancements, we are going back. If you look at Europe, any baby who is born after 20 weeks, which is half the gestation, I said 40 weeks is a full term. They will take this baby and they will resuscitate that baby, basically making their lungs to work. If for us at present, we take 22 weeks and above. So let me tell you, a 22 weeks baby is about 400, 500 grams. Their weight is about two iPhones. If you put two iPhones and put one baby, that's the same weight. So you can imagine how small that baby is. And our challenges are to work with that baby so that we can make survival. So just to showing you here, so this is like a normal journey of pregnancy. When one wants to become pregnant, so this is what they wanted to do. There are three trimesters. Each trimester is about 12 to 13 weeks. And this is how it progresses. And this is what every parent or every family, they are expecting. For us, for me also, I wanted to have a baby who is like healthy. And this is kind of the picture which we see in the television, we see in the movies that, you know, you're getting pregnant, you're getting a healthy baby. This is what you are expecting. But what if your first babies look and your baby is born like this? This is a premature baby born about 25, 26 weeks. This is a breathing tube going through baby's mouth into the baby's airway so that we can do gas exchange. And that's how we try to sustain these babies. I put a picture of a baby who is a little bit bigger. And this baby is about like 900 grams to a 1000 gram or a kilo. Imagine a baby who is half this size, have a tube going through the nose and through the throat. And then we start to resuscitate these babies. This is another small premature baby, same scenario. Look at the skin on this baby. If it baby is born five years from now, today, like five years in the back, this is an abortion. We don't do anything for this baby. But with now, with advancements in medicine, we try to treat this baby. Also, it comes down to how desired is that pregnancy. Some parents are there and they are trying to get pregnant for years and years and years. And this is their only chance to have a baby. So we are pushed to do everything in our capacity what we can do. And the cost is lung disease. Because these lungs, they are not meant to do oxygenation. And we try to do that. Then once they get a little bit older, the breathing tube comes out and then the tube goes in their nose. This is a cannula. We provide high pressure oxygenation through that. And that's the next stage. So this is kind of a baby which is equivalent to a full term baby requiring oxygen. Then they go a little bit older and then they have cannula like this and then they go to school like this. So this is how their life is. So they have a cannula attached to them. They have an oxygen cylinder attached to their backpack. I don't know if you have any experience if you have a colleague or friend who has lung disease and they have small oxygen cylinder attached to them and they are going with that and they have this catheter in their nose and then they work through that. So this is like a quite challenging. It's not only challenging for the like the patient itself, but it's for the family also. You know how much effort it takes to clean these, to get an oxygen cylinder delivered every single day to your home, to change the oxygen cylinder to stay away from anybody who is smoking or even trying to smoke around you because oxygen is highly flammable. These cylinders, the major cause is that if they are in an area where there is like any spark or anything, they can burst, the oxygen cylinder can burst. So they have to have like a lot of limitations on their life. But still, if you ask the parents of this baby right here, it's still desirable. They would love to have this baby to survive and find some cure for their lung disease. So that's where we come in. So when I started my training, we wanted to see if there is something we can do for these babies. 
because all these babies who are coming to us, they ultimately get lung disease and go like this. And then once they are a little bit older, they develop asthma, they get infections, and that's like another continuation. So we call this as neonatal chronic lung disease. We also call it as BPD. If you search it, you will find a lot of information about it. BPD is like bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So what it really means is that these lungs, when they are born, they have, instead of having normal gas exchange units, which are called alveoli, they are all messed up. Because we give them pressure, we try to open them. And once we try to keep them open with our pressure, they get inflamed and they get stiff. So now they don't close. So that's COPD in old people. When the people are older, they get lung disease. It's called COPD. You must have seen ads in the TV. People with COPD are exactly like these babies which we have. They have the oxygen requirement. They have oxygen cylinder. They have everything like that. And then it doesn't stop there because the disease continues to evolve. And as the kids get older and older, you have further and further lung injury. So once we have these babies, half of them do not make it out of the ICU. 50% of them die in the ICU because no matter what efforts we do, the gas exchange, their lungs give up at some point because these lungs are not meant to do anything. These lungs have no capacity to do gas exchange. We force them to do it. Other 50, 60% which get home, then they have repeated infections. They get an infection, especially this time of the year when there is a lot of influenza around. Even with flu shots, they will still get influenza. For us, healthy people who has normal lungs, it might be a minor illness. For those whose lungs are already working at 20, 30% of the capacity, if they have like an other hit with pneumonia or influenza, they will be admitted to the hospital. They might require a breathing tube again. They might require medications again. They also have issues with their heart thickening and they have blood pressure issues. They don't grow well. Their brain growth is poor. They have poor school performance because their brain doesn't get that much oxygen which is required for the brain to receive. And all this actually ultimately affect the family dynamics because if you see that family, how they are working with these babies, then it's like quite challenging. So this is what we have. So this is how normal air sacs or alveolar units are. So this is just a section of the lungs showing like how we have normal small air units which are doing gas exchange. When we have lung injury, we try to force these units to keep open and force them to keep open further and further and further. So what's gonna happen? Like when you try to put air into a balloon and keep inflating and inflating it, at some point balloon is gonna give away and it's gonna rupture. Once it ruptures, it causes inflammation around it. And that's what causes lung stiffness. Whenever we have a scar, that area gets stiffer. So when you have a scar around this alveolar unit, it's not gonna expand any further. So that scar is gonna stay within the lung. So that's like chronic lung disease, that's BPD, that's lung injury in like, you know, simple terms. So why it's important, why we are like struggling to work to find a cure for the lung disease. These numbers are for almost five, six years ago, and it's probably doubled by now. About 100,000 of 120,000 babies in the United States every year, they are at risk to develop lung injury. And then every day, about 100 babies develop lung disease. Every single day, while I'm talking to you guys, there are 100 babies here who are gonna be developing the lung disease. 20,000 new cases are diagnosed annually. And then next year, the chronic lung disease will be number one disease of babies and children. Right now, up until today, the number one disease is asthma. 90% of asthmatic in the current day and age are babies who have chronic lung disease. So if we don't find any treatment or cure, ne starting next year, this disease is gonna bypass asthma. So it will be all lung disease, chronic lung disease, and going from there. With same situations and scenarios, we are asked to expand our NICUs. So we have capacity of 44 beds at UCI. We are part of UCI Chalk Alliance. At Chalk Children's Hospital of Orange County, we have about 78 capacities. We do not have sufficient beds to accommodate these babies because we are expect, accepting babies who are born at 22 weeks, 23 weeks, which in the past we would not accept to the ICU. We would not even do anything to those babies. So now we are running out of beds. So if I have 44 beds, I have at least 40 babies who are developing lung disease in the NICU. Chalk children's have the same. They have almost like 70 or 80 babies every day who are suffering from the lung disease. 
But what's, what we can do for these babies? Nothing. Just hope that we can find a cure or we can find anything which can help feed their lungs. So 50% of these babies, as we talk, they will be getting admitted again in the first year. 36% in the second year, which means almost all these babies, by the time they reach two, they have an other admission to the hospital, especially in the pediatric ICU or neonatal ICU if they are still young. When they are born, they stay about four months in the ICU. And it costs about $150,000 during those four months to care for these babies. Because the interventions, the ventilator management, oxygen, it comes at a cost. And then when they get readmitted, it costs another forty-five dollars to $50,000. So it's a lot of money we are putting to help these babies. But still, these babies will be, we know that these babies will be developing the lung disease. And then, as I told you, at present, the cost of these babies to care for these babies exceeds asthma. And then about $2.4 to $3 billion are spent to care for infants with lung disease right now. And then what is the treatment? Is there any treatment, any cure, anything? There's nothing we can do to help their lungs at present. There is no effective treatment available. And what we do right now is just supportive treatment. We help their lungs. We support them, we give them medications, we give them steroids to help lung inflammation, we give them inhalers so that their lungs don't get stiff, but that's all supportive. It does not help with the problem, helping with the inflammation. So what my work, I'm just like, Eileen has like set up a base for the work basically, and as mentioned, like, you know, mesenchymal stem cells. So for us, we are fortunate enough, the reason a lot of pharmaceutical companies they do not make umbilical cord stem cells because they do not have access to umbilical cords. Because it's very hard to come to an academic center and try to collect. For us, when a baby is born, they have an umbilical cord. What happens to normally to that umbilical cord? We discard it with the placenta, we throw it away. But for now, when we started these trials, when a baby is born premature, we take a segment of their cord umbilical cord, and we take it with us to the ICU, and then we save it so that we can prepare stem cells from that. I'm not going to go into details. Eileen already mentioned what is a stem cell. You already know it's a pluripotent cell, and it can generate into all the three germ layers of the body. Again, Eileen went through the classification. So we work exclusively with the umbilical cord stem cells. And these are all the sources which she mentioned. So we have the umbilical cord, which we work with. So what we are doing, so what my lab and my focus here is what we are doing is once a baby is born, we take a segment of their cord, we take it to our labs, we process it, and we generate these cells. These cells, what we call them, we call them plastic adherent cells or stromal cells. These are the cells here which are all in these private clinics and you know, like all these fake doctors and they are giving you is these cells. These are just a plastic adherent cell. It's a stromal cell, which is a byproduct of the stem cell generation process. So they label them as stem cells and they give it to you. So what's the difference between these cells and what we make is that for these cells, if we generate 100 of these cells, only one is stem cell in them. 99 are just stromal cells. And how we know which one are the stem cell, actually we grow these cells, and then we provide them with the proper ingredients. So if it is a stem cell, as we mentioned before, it should generate into any of the three germ layers. So it could generate muscle, it can generate bone, it, could, it should develop into anything what we want it to go. So what we do is we take these cells, we provide them with ingredients, so we convert them into fat cells, and we convert them into bone. So if you do that, like, you know, you show that these cells can be converted into bone and fat, those are the cells which are actually the mesenchymal stem cells, according to our FDA classification. So we use these cells in our studies. So just to give you, like Eileen mentioned too, we have been approached a lot of time by these pharmaceutical companies to do a clinical trial in babies. And as I said, we don't want right product in wrong hands, or we don't want wrong product in wrong hands. So we told them, no, we are not ready. We haven't done all the safety studies. So what happened was some of the pharmaceutical companies took these stromal cells and they did a clinical trial for this chronic lung disease in Korea. So if you search pneumostem, you will find a clinical trial. So they enrolled 12 babies. They gave these stem cells through the breathing tube into their lungs, and they thought they are gonna cure them. 
So most of these babies die right away because they choked on these stem cells. And the who, one who survived, they develop tumors in their brain, in their liver, because we can't control where these cells are going. Then it was labeled, these cells are bad, we shouldn't use them. So that's where we come in because the cells are not bad. These were wrong cells in wrong hands, which is bad. We are not ready to do any clinical trial yet because we just want to make sure these cells are what they are supposed to do. So that's the first thing, growth potential. Second is secondary sanctuaries. When I'm working with these stem cells, we inject these stem cells, we do animal studies first. We go with our animal committee. We, we go through them. We tell them how we are going to treat these animals. And we inject these stem cells. So what we found was these stem cells actually help the lungs. They prevent the lung disease. But if I inject 50,000 stem cells into the baby mouse, I see only five there. Where are the rest of the almost 49,000 cells where they are going? So when we looked at it, they were going into the brain, they were going into the liver, they were doing exactly like these companies did the trial in babies. So they were making tumors in the lungs, like tumor in the liver, tumor in the brain. So we said, this is not like a right approach yet because we can't control the fate of these cells where they are going. So then we came to targeted therapy. Like, can we do something? We can change the fate of these cells somehow where we can say they are only gonna generate lung and not do anything else. So we'll go into in details in a second. And then side effects, you know, like these are cells. So you're injecting cells into a vessel or into the lungs, they are gonna get stuck into the small blood vessels of the baby. They are gonna cause like choking in the lungs, they are gonna cause stroke. So those are the complications which can happen. So that's why we are still working with these cells. We are not ready to do a clinical trial. So what we did was that one interesting thing we did is that these cells secrete a lot of factors when we grow them into the media or into the serum or into the juice which they grow in. So what we found was that a lot of these factors which they secrete can actually prevent lung injury. So if you see here, I have highlighted some of these factors. I don't want to go into the details what they are, but these are all the factors which can generate Lung. So what we have found is that if you take these factors, you take an artificial lung, you provide these factors, the lung will grow and recover from injury. So what we wanted to do next was to see our umbilical cord stem cells, when we generate them, we grow them, will they secrete these factors? And in the blue section, they do. All these stem cells, they secrete these factors into their juices. So what we did is we filter these cells out and we are just using these juices which contains no cells. And we wanted to see if that can be used as a treatment, as a medication. We just take this small juice, which contain a lot of factors in it. We give it to the babies and whether this can help. So this is the trial where we are doing right now. This is the first study we did and completed and we are working on it. So this is a mouse model. So we tested all our cells, make sure these are mesenchymal stem cells. We take a mouse, we put them in oxygen. So when you give a lot of oxygen to a mouse, like a baby mouse, their lungs develop a lot of inflammation. So they become just like the lungs as if our babies are developing lung injury. So when these mouse are about four days into oxygen, we inject them with our cocktail of the juices. And then we keep them for two more weeks in there and that we look at the mouse's lungs to see if the mouse has recovered from lung injury or not. So not gonna go again much into details, but if you see that it's a quite a challenging work. So that's why pharmaceutical companies look for quick answers and short answers. They wanna go right away to the babies. So this is a small mouse, baby mouse. I don't know if you guys have seen like a big mouse. So this is a baby mouse. So it's about like two grams. So this is a light source. This is a baby mouse I'm holding in my hand. So it's like about like a maybe tip of the little finger. This is an injection prepared with stem cell juices and we have a blue dye in it because we just want to make sure when we inject this medication into the mouse, it actually goes into mouse's vein, goes to the heart and goes into the rest of the body because we want this medication to circulate through the whole body so that we can look for side effects. So this is how I'm injecting it. I'm looking, I don't know if you guys see it, but there are small vessels here. I'm a neonatologist, I work with these babies. So we have like ways, like, you know, with the light, we can see that very small, small vessels, like we look into the babies. This is here, I'm injecting the medication. I don't know if, know if you guys can see it clearly, but there is, you can see there's a tiny blue streak developing there. So this is what happens. If the injection is successful, the mouse will turn blue. Whole mouse will turn blue. But if the injection is unsuccessful, you will see 
that the mouse remains pink. So that's how we know that the medication which we have given to the mouse, it has gone into the whole body of the mouse, and now we can study this mouse. So then what the stem cell juices did, they actually prevented lung injury. So this is a histopathology, just showing you the slides. When we take the lung, we make a section of the lung. This is how normal lungs look. So there are like tiny, tiny tree branches. So if you have lung injury, as I told you, we try to expand the lungs. You will see a lot of open spaces. So this is the lung injury. And if you give them the stem cell juices, they have like normal, completely normal branching again, which means that we have a lung injury created. We give them the juices and we prevented the lung injury. We made the lung normal again. Same goes for the tiny blood vessels. If you look at here, they are just like a tiny thin hair. When you have injury, the vessels become very, very thick because there is a lot of inflammation around them. And when we give our stem cell juice, it becomes normal again. So that tells us that, you know, when we have these stem cell juices, which contain a lot of these factors, they are actually preventing the lung injury to happen. So we can actually cure this disease by giving them stem cell juices. This is shown here also with the lung function. I don't know if any of you have asthma, you go to a doctor, they ask you to blow into a pipe and then you blow it and then we look at your lung function. So this is looking at mouse's lung function. So basically for you, like for us, we don't do this where we just look at your lung function, you blow into a pipe and we look at it, how much resistance your lungs have. Here I'm giving the mouse methacholine at higher, 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 higher dosages to the point where the lungs will have a severe allergic reaction. So when there is a lung disease, every dose increment I do, the lungs have high resistance, which means they doesn't let the air to go in. If I give another dose, the air resistance goes up. If I give another dose, it goes very up. If you don't have any lung injury, let's give you one of you guys, you will be the blue line here. I keep giving you the injection, your lung have the capacity to re respond, you have a reserve which will prevent it. And when we give the stem cell extract, it also prevented the same as it's like a normal lungs. We have a little bit hike towards the end, which we are working on to see why we have a hike, but this is what we see. Then the other way we do is do echocardiograms, which is the ultrasound of the heart to look at thickening of the heart muscle. And we found that when we give our juices, the heart muscles do not get thick there is no blood pressure changes in these mice. So now we know that once we do all this, we can actually prevent the lung injury and we can prevent this chronic lung disease. We are refining our techniques. We are still not ready for a clinical trial. What we are doing right now is we are watching these mice up to a year of life. The mouse age, once they are born, is about nine months to a year. We wanted to see down the road, we give them injection now, what happened to this mouse six months later? What happens to this mouse nine months later? Because we do not want to have any side effect. Because this is the whole life for a baby too. If a baby is born, and I'm giving this injection on fourth day of a baby, that baby has 70, 80 year life, we might have side effects down the road. That's why we don't want to run into premature trials and do those things. So next question comes in. So I just convinced you guys, I showed you the data that stem cells are working to prevent this lung injury by providing these factors, which I showed you. So the logical question is, if these babies who develop lung injury, they should be deficient in these factors, right? So if the stem cell is giving a factor X to the mouse to help lung injury, it means that the mouse who received this factor S should be deficient in it. It should not have that factor. So what we did is that at UCI, we did the very first trial where we looked at these premature babies, we lavage their lungs, and we look at the factors what are there. So what we found is that the babies who develop severe lung injury, they do not have these factors. Look at these levels here. These are the babies who develop lung injury. Look at the levels of these factors there, which stem cells provide. And look at the levels of inflammation. So this is the low showing inflammation. So if you don't have these two factors, you have high inflammation and lung injury. But the babies, if we provide these two factors, they have suppression of lung inflammation here, and you do not develop lung injury. So this is another proof saying that some of these factors which stem cells are providing, they are actually helping with these babies. They will help with these babies' lungs. So as I said, we are working towards it. We don't want to rush into, we don't want to produce wrong cells. We don't want to produce 
like right cell, give it to wrong hand. So we are currently refining our techniques. We have our first FDA interaction meeting coming up in March, where we're gonna show them this data that we are generating and talk to them about the clinical trials and how we can refine it. We are also working with a facility in San Diego because as Eileen mentioned, the major problem right now, the cells I'm making, I'm making it in like pristine conditions, but we are making them here. So we are not like a, a pharmaceutical grade company or like, you know, which we can make cells without having a contamination or impurities. So the lab at San Diego, they actually prepare these cells for clinical trials, which we will start doing it too soon. But right now we are working with this lab who will take our umbilical cords and generate these stem cells for us. And then we will use it in babies from the clinical trial for that. So this is what the ultimate goal is. So with baby who is at risk to develop lung disease, we take the umbilical cord, we process it, we treat it the same baby. So that's our goal right now. And that's where we are working on. So with all our work, as I mentioned, I've been approached a lot of time. I get almost more than 100 emails daily from parents, they're looking at our website, they're looking at our work, and they're asking, can their babies get these stem cells? Can their babies get, even the babies whose umbilical cords we have taken to generate these stem cells, they are hopeful that in the coming years, hopefully we will generate these stem cells as a medication. It will come as an injection where you just give them one injection in doctor's office and they will be happy for a year, two years, three years, and then they will get another injection and then they will be happy another two, three years. But our answers to them right now is the same, that we are working on it, we want to refine our techniques. We Once we have like a, everything in place, then we will work towards trial. They will send me the same email. They will even send me like a screenshots. There are like these fake doctors or the fake sites. They have clinics here in Southern California. You can't even believe it. In your neighborhood, you might see somebody doing this. They wanted to come, these babies to come in, pay $50,000, and they will cure their lung disease. There are a lot of like, you know, mishaps happen. People are going outside the country, going to Mexico and other places to do that. And I know there are a lot of, you know, like drug companies, they started their trials in outside countries because we can't allow them to do it here. So be careful, like, you know, what you are looking at, and then, you know, the resources I ensured you, they are beautiful resources. Go there and look at that to go from there. So we have been like recognized for our work. Like I have presented my work in all the international conference. We have been recognized in so many places. And we just wanted to show you this work that, you know, like if you have any, you know, like inside, you want to look at it. If you want to observe our ICU, you want to come in and see how we treat NICU babies. Please more than welcome, just let me know. So the bottom line now is that the summary is basically that babies who develop lung disease, they lack these stem cell specific proteins. Stem cells protein or their juices, they can provide this protein and we can generate this exciting new therapy for this chronic lung disease. So that's what our goal is right now. So our that's motto of our lab until every child is healed of PPD. So we'll take the questions. Questions? Oh, come on. Yeah. You said that um, chronic lung disease was on the rise. Do you know the reason for that? We were not resuscitating babies who were born at 22 weeks, 23 weeks, 24 weeks. We were letting them go past naturally. Even if they are born, they have few breaths. We do not intervene because we know that these babies don't have lung capacity to recover, do gas exchange and survive. With our advancements now, with smaller ventilators, smaller, because the biggest challenge why we wouldn't do that was, we didn't have a breathing tube so small, which we can go to their airway because their airway is very, very tiny. Now we have new set of breathing tubes came in. So that I said 400 grams or so, we can put a breathing tube in. So any baby who is born 22, 23, 24, 25, we do resuscitation on these babies. So if you look at the abortion rate, about like 15% of the babies will consider abortion. These 15% babies are now part of this lung pool because we resuscitate these babies. So like last year, if you don't have these 15% babies, you don't have that much lung disease. So now this year, if I have all these 15% babies surviving and adding to the chronic lung disease pool, they will. And as the reason we call it chronic lung disease, because there is no cure. So once you have this lung disease, you have this lung disease for the rest of your life. 
So if I have 20,000 patients last year, and I have 20,000 this year, but I have a 15% more because I'm resuscitating more babies, so now I have like, let's say, 30,000 patients, so it will make 50,000 rather than 40,000. So that's every year, every single day actually, or every hour, it's an incremental increase in there. That's why we are running out of NICU capacity. We are trying to expand our NICUs because we need to accommodate these babies. That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that um, the premature babies are in, unable to uh, make the protein factors. Do you foresee like a future treatment, um, like rehabilitating that instead of like having like two or three years injection every single time? Yeah. So at this moment, we don't know what is the right approach or what's the right answer. Because for us, who doesn't go through this prematurity, like a normal newborn baby. Some of normal newborn babies even have a little bit lower level of these factors, but they produce them, their lungs produce them, and lungs technically keep on growing until the, we are seven years old. But if the lungs get damaged and then they recover, we don't know how much they will produce. Right now with our animal work, we are giving one injection and we are seeing protection for the rest of the lifespan of the mouse, which is six months to nine months. But whether this one injection alone will be sufficient for a clinical trial for a baby, that will happen when we start a clinical trial. We'll give them one injection, we'll follow these babies and see what happens to their lung injury. And let's say three years later, they have a little, you know, like flare or then, we might need a second injection. We don't know the details for that yet, but that's a very good question. At this moment, we don't know. For mouse, we are using just one injection. You mentioned that uh, you started resuscitating babies after the 20th week. Why the 20th week? Like what's unique about that specific date and what happens if you were to do it earlier? Again, excellent question. So as I mentioned partly with the question from you that the problem we have is we can technically resuscitate any baby, you know. Once that they are about 18 weeks baby is fully formed in organs. So if you look at a baby, the picture I showed you, complete skin starts around 18 weeks. That's the time then, I don't know if you guys know, 18 weeks is the time when we do detailed ultrasounds on the baby or the fetus at that time. That's called anatomical survey. That happens at 18 weeks. What we do in that is that we check that the baby's skin is developed, the baby's heart should be functioning on its own at that time. There should be all the organ system developed normally. So that's 18 weeks landmark. So if we can resuscitate these babies, we could do at 18 weeks. The challenge is that at 18 weeks, their airway is so small, we cannot put a breathing tube in there. And as I mentioned, for a baby to come out and survive, they have to breathe, their lungs have to start doing gas exchange. So in the past, our smallest breathing tube will go in a baby who is about 24, 25 weeks. Now we have a new set of smaller tubes and that can go to 22 to 23 weeks. As I mentioned, Europe, some countries, they have even further smaller tubes and they are resuscitating babies born after 20 weeks. Here in the United States, we are at 22 weeks right now. The reason is like we can make as small a tube as we can. The challenge is that who is gonna put that breathing tube? I do not know if you guys have seen it. Just try to Google it and see putting a breathing tube in a premature baby. There are some videos there. It's a quite a challenge. So you go in the small mouth, you have to find the airway, you have to separate it from the food pipe, which is the esophagus, and you have to pass this catheter, which is very like, you know, fluffy, through that tiny hole of the airway and you have to pass it into the baby's lungs. So it's quite a technique. So if like, you know, we have catheters which are stiffer, they can perforate it, they can go through and through and then the baby dies right away. So that's why like right now we are looking, so we are always behind Europe, let me tell you that way. They go first, they test these, all these catheters and everything. And then a few years later, once the safety data is available, we do that. So as of now, we have a 2O, so the tubes comes in different sizes. So it started 2.5 in the past. So now we have two French size, which is like a very tiny, like a hole, like, you know, I don't know, you know, you, you used to have those coffee straws. 
the one with the very thin one, you know, straight coffee straws, that's two O size. You can see how much coffee comes out of it when you try to drink a coffee. That's the straw we try to give ventilation to these babies. Anything smaller than that, I doubt we will get it. But Europe is using the same straws or same tubes for 20 weeks onwards. We haven't done that yet, but I think we are getting there. In a couple of years from now, we will be resuscitating babies who are born after 20, especially if we are going into clinical trials and we can find something to prevent their lung disease. Um, I was curious about what, like how the proteins work to prevent lung disease, or like, like an example of a function of a protein that allows it to prevent the lung disease. Again, very good question. I skipped some of the slides. So basically, as mentioned briefly, the biggest issue with these babies and these lungs is that there is a lot of cell death, like there's alveoli or the lung units are dying, and there is a lot of inflammation. And we all, all of us have stem cells in every organ too. Let's say if I have an injury and I have a cut to my muscle, my muscle will regenerate, right? We all have experienced that. We have like bad injuries, we have muscle injuries, or we have a fracture, let's say, the bone heals. How it heals? Because the intrinsic stem cells, which are sitting there, they get a signal from the injured cells saying that, okay, we are injured. So they will secrete these factors or proteins which we are seeing. They will go there, they will work with these injured cells, and they do a switch, molecular switch. So these cells become stem cells themselves, and then they heal it. What we think is that these cells, proteins which we are giving, they are working with babies' intrinsic cells, and converting them into more primitive cells. So premature babies already have lung cells, which are very primitive. They are very primitive. These lung cells, if I take it from premature babies, I can actually generate them into stem cells because these are very primitive cells because the lung is still developing. So lung, when the lung is developing, the blood vessels within the lung is developing from the same cells too. So as Eileen mentioned, there's a mesenchyme, there's endothelial layer, and there is an ectodermal layer. So all three are there. So that's what we thought, that's what I showed you a brief slide of TGF beta 1, one of the molecules, which is inflammation. So these cells suppress inflammation also. What is happening at the basic molecular level, we are still looking at that. Hey, I'm gonna go here. Can you pass this? We have one more. Um, I noticed throughout the presentation there wasn't much mention of transplants, and I, I recognize that neonatal lungs are probably really hard to come by, but I was wondering what would happen if an infant or young child with um, BPD or like lung disease, um, if they were implanted, if they had, if they were given new lungs, would the would their lungs still eventually fail because like their lungs would be brand new compared to like the rest of their body which had been like deprived of oxygen for so long like w would that make a difference you don't answer that question so what do you think why we don't want why, why do you think about even children or like anybody why are you going to why we don't want transplants? Rejection is one of the things quite available. The biggest challenge is when somebody dies, what's the part of that? Heart and lung failure. That's how we die. So when we die, we are harvesting organs. We put their lungs on artificial support so that we can give oxygen to other organs of the liver. Kidneys, heart, but lung itself, we are on by. If some stages, you have some stages where somebody is an organ donor and is not completely died but is still in the stage that can be masculine children, you take some people for lung. The problem is when you do lung transplant, you have to do a lot of chemotherapy, right? you have to do medications to prevent rejection. And future babies or babies or the children, these are not compatible. So that's why one more. So you have a question, right? Can you shout it and just repeat it? Are there like any risks of the patient's body like rejecting the injection? Or like is the goal to have all of the injections be made from this patient specific embryo? Excellent question. 
So what we are doing right now is the biggest challenge is going to be if I'm using baby X stem cell and injecting into baby Y, those can be rejected, right? So the beauty is that the mesenchymal stem cells are immunomodulant. So they do not have like, you know, factors or receptors on them which can cause graft versus host disease where you can inject one cell like a blood transfusion you know giving o positive person a positive blood so the antibodies in the o positive person will attack those cells so the mesenchymal stem cells are immunomodulant number one number two we are not using cells so we are taking their juices and we are filtering the cells out so we are not using the cells at this moment. So both of these, when we were using cells only, we actually looked into that, how the graft versus host disease will come. That's how we came to know very few cells actually stays in the lungs and all of them are going other way, causing tumorous, you know, like growth in the other parts of the body. But that's an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. You said that uh, heart thickening is a complication of BPD, but how specific? Yeah. So. Yeah. Again, very good question. So, what happens is like normal heart. We have like two sides, right? So we have right side of the heart and left side of the heart, right? So all the blood which is dirty or contains less oxygen from the body goes into the right side of the heart, right? From the right side, the right heart pumps this blood into the lungs, correct? Lungs clean it, send it to the left heart and left heart send it to the body. So normally for a normal baby or for all of us, when the right heart is pumping this blood into the lungs, our lungs are not stiff. Our blood vessels are not thickened, right? They are not very thick, they are normal vessels. So it takes very little effort or push from the heart to send this blood into the lung, right? In babies who develop lung disease, their lungs are very stiff. They don't open. Their blood vessels get very stiff too. So now this heart has to pump blood into these stiff blood vessels. So it has to work more and more and more, right? It's the same thing, you know, like you have a, like, um, like a water hose and you have a large pipe attached to it. So it will be just very easy to sprinkle it. And then you have a very tiny pipe attached to it. You will need much more force to do that. So when the right side of the heart keep pumping this blood faster and harder and harder, the right side muscle starts to develop, you know, like thickness too. Because now the right heart has to work more. That's how they develop this right heart. So normally all of us, like if we have a hypertension, we have a blood pressure issues, it's the left side of the heart which we can measure it on the arm, right? So when we go to doctor's office. For these babies, they develop right ventricle, right side hypertension, which we have other sophisticated ways to measure, which I showed one way is the echocardiogram, looking at the thickness of the heart. So ultimately, when the left heart starts to fail, it's not gonna pump blood into the lungs, right? And then when the blood is not coming to the left heart, left heart to work harder to send this half amount of blood into the body, so then the left heart starts to fail too. That's how they have lung, like heart disease. Um, how do you get the cells to produce the proteins you want? Yes, that's a <laughs> very good question. So I wish I know how to tell cells what protein to produce. So it was incidental finding how we discovered that these cells produce protein is was like one of like you guys like one of students working with us he came to us with an observation saying that so as eileen mentioned all stem cells we have to have control cells if i'm injecting a stem cell i need to have a control mouse where i'm injecting some muscle cells or something saying that it's not just like you know by chance that we treated this right so when we were growing these cells, we also have some muscle cells to grow. We were taking dermal cells, you know, skin cells to grow. So one of my postdocs, so they came with an observation saying that the cells, when we grow stem cells, two days, we change their medium every two to three days to give them fresh medium so that they grow. He's saying whenever he changed the medium, the stem cell medium is very thick, it's like soup. And the medium from the muscle 
and from the skin cells it's the same as he put it few days ago he doesn't even think that it needs to be changed right so we looked at it and we said that's strange the medium is really thick it may be containing some factors or dead cells right so then we started counting the cells we played 50000 cells they grow so they become $200,000, uh, 200,000 cells in two, years, two days. Yeah, I know, I wish I made cells, two dollars. Anyway, so we looked at it and then we took this medium out and we have a sophisticated process called proteomics analysis where you can put this media into a gel, put it through the machine and machine tell you how many proteins are there, right? So we did that first time. So the cells, our cells produce more than 1,000 proteins at any given time but we only look at what's the highest concentration of proteins being produced. That's why we are using still the stem cell juice, which contain all these thousand proteins to give it to the babies, to give it to the mouse babies to use that. Because we still don't know out of these thousand or 1100 proteins, which are more active. But we do know that four of them, which I showed, if they are not there, if we knock them out, take it out of them, then the cells don't work. So this is how we came to know that. But there is no way I can direct these cells to produce only a certain protein, at least right now. Maybe there are some techniques, we have something in the future. Any other questions? So is there one microphone down? Sure. I can bring the mic. I'll just walk around, so I'll repeat your question. Uh, okay, so you talked about how one of the biggest complications of BPD would be stiffer lung tissues and stiffer like heart tissues. Um, so if potentially there were like medications or steroids that could uh, make these at normal function and normal capacity, would the lungs and the body still be working at um, inefficient rates despite having these pathways to do so? Challenge we have, that's what we are trying to do right now, right? So the challenge we have right now is all supportive therapy. Once the lungs get stiff, there is no way for them to get unstiff. So what we'd want to do is, we want to give the medication before they get stiff. So these medications, once we give them, we can make the lungs work harder, but they will prevent inflammation to happen. They will prevent the cells rupture to happen. So that's how we will treat it. That's what we are trying to do. We give them an injection before the lung injury starts. So the lung injury doesn't happen until the babies are two weeks, three weeks old, and we've gone through all this process. So we want to give them this injection when they are four days old, so that this injection will prevent lung injury, right? So once the lung injury has already happened, then we still give them injections. We can prevent it, but only half of it then lungs needs to grow. That's what we are doing right now with steroids, with water pills, with asthma inhalers. We are trying to help the lungs, but not much. We have one more question. Okay, let's say just one more question, maybe. Yeah, there's one more. So if the goal is ultimately to like cure BPD in all babies, and there is like a point in medicine where you have a treatment to cure that, would that be something that the parents have to pay for, or would that be something provided? And if it is something that they have to pay for, what happens if they can't afford it? So again, excellent question. So once we are in the clinical trial phase, they don't have to pay anything. So it's all covered. That's why we are looking for these federal funding and grants and everything. Once it becomes a medication, then still, for babies, like I don't know if you guys know that or not, because when they are in the ICU, all the cost which is associated with the ICU stay, which is about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a day, is covered by the state. So they are under the state insurance or Medicare program, so they don't pay anything. Challenge is going to come once they are outside home and need these medications. So their insurance needs to cover, like we have copay for five bucks or ten bucks for our medication. It's going to be similar to that. So if everyone could just join me in thanking Dr. Aslam. Um, what, what you don't know, but I know, is that he has an extraordinary complicated, extraordinarily complicated work schedule right now, both as a clinician scientist and because we're down one neonatologist at, at UCI, as who's just explaining to me. So he jumped through a lot of hurdles in terms of trading all-nighters and schedules to be able to be here tonight. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you.